Our story begins around 430 BCE in ancient Greece with a philosopher named Democritus. He believed that everything in the universe is made of tiny invisible particles that he called atoms. According to him, atoms are eternal, which means they never die, and they are indivisible, which means they cannot be broken into smaller parts. He said that atoms have different shapes and sizes, but they don't have different internal qualities like color or taste. The way atoms group together, he said, determines the properties of the matter they form. So depending on how the atoms arrange themselves, you might get a rock or water or air. Centuries later, in the year 1807, a scientist named John Dalton took these ideas and gave them a scientific twist. Dalton said that atoms are like tiny, solid spheres that cannot be broken down. He believed that all atoms of the same element are exactly alike, and atoms of different elements are different. For example, a pure sample of gold from a riverbed in California would have atoms with the exact same mass and chemical properties as a pure sample of gold from a mine in South Africa. Conversely, a gold atom is distinctly different from a carbon atom. They have different masses, different sizes, and different chemical properties. He also said that atoms join together in fixed and definite ratios to form compounds. For example, water is always made of two hydrogen atoms and one oxygen atom. Dalton's model gave us a very solid start in the world of chemistry. Then, in the year 1904, Sir J. J. Thompson entered the picture. He discovered something very important, which was the electron, a tiny particle inside the atom with a negative charge. Dalton had said that atoms were solid, but Thompson said that if atoms have negative electrons, then there must be some kind of positive charge too, to keep the atom balanced. So he imagined the atom like a soft dessert a pudding with raisins. The positive charge was like the soft pudding, and the negative electrons were like little raisins stuck inside. This model was called the plum pudding model. It was a creative idea at the time, but new experiments soon raised big questions. That's when Ernest Rutherford came in, in the year 1911. He did a famous experiment called the gold foil experiment. He shot tiny particles called alpha particles at a very thin sheet of gold. According to Thomson's model, all the particles should have passed straight through. But to his surprise, most did go through, yet some bounced back, as if they hit something hard. This made him realize that the atom is mostly empty space, but there is a tiny, dense center where most of the positive charge is found. He called this center the nucleus. This changed everything. He proposed a new model, called the planetary model, where the electrons move around the nucleus like planets around the sun. This model made a lot more sense, but it still had a problem. According to classical physics, if electrons were moving in circles, they would lose energy and spiral into the nucleus, making the atom collapse. But clearly, atoms are stable. So what's the answer? Enter Niels Bohr in the year 1913. He solved the problem with three big ideas. First, he said that electrons move in fixed circular paths called orbits, and as long as they stay in those orbits, they do not gain or lose energy. Second, he said that if an electron jumps from a lower orbit to a higher one, it must absorb energy. Third, if the electron falls from a higher orbit to a lower one, it gives off that extra energy in the form of light. The light comes out in little packets called photons. This idea brought quantum mechanics into atomic theory, the science of very tiny particles, where normal rules no longer apply. But the story didn't stop there. Another scientist named Sommerfeld came along and said that electrons don't just move in perfect circles. He said they can also move in elliptical paths, like stretched out circles. Why this matters? Because elliptical orbits mean that electrons can be closer or farther from the nucleus 
at different times. This explains why electrons within the same energy level or within the same orbit might have slightly different energies. Think of an energy level like a building floor and sublevels like rooms on that floor. So, for example, energy level 2, or the second orbit, might have two sublevels called S orbitals and P orbitals. So now we had a more refined picture with main energy levels and sublevels inside them. Then came Erwin Schrödinger, who changed the way we think about electrons completely. He said we shouldn't think of electrons as little balls spinning in circles. Instead, we should think of them as waves. He used complex mathematics to describe the behavior of electrons as wave functions. His model did not talk about exact positions, but about where an electron is most likely to be found. He introduced the idea of a probability cloud, a fuzzy region in space where the electron is most likely to be found. His work was based on the ideas of de Broglie, who said particles like electrons can behave like waves, and Werner Heisenberg, who explained that we can never know both the position and the speed of a particle exactly at the same time, which is also called the uncertainty principle. In this model, we no longer talk about circular or elliptical orbits. Instead, we talk about orbitals. An orbital is a region in space where the chance of finding an electron is the highest. It's not a clear path, like a road, but more like a cloud where the electron is probably hiding. This is how our understanding of atoms grew. If you enjoyed this video, please don't forget to like, share, and subscribe to our channel. Also, you can support my channel by joining our community and becoming a member. So good.